everyone, uh, just real quickly, sorry for the little delay there in uploads. I ended up getting kind of sick. I was uh, having some heart issues, but uh, luckily I am feeling a lot better now. Uh, thank you to all the folks that were uh, sending me well wishes over on my Instagram uh, after I posted in my Instagram stories. Luckily, I am feeling a lot better now, and I figured I would come back to you guys with a super extra long episode, so that's why you're getting this uh, hour plus episode today. Anyway, uh, if you are brand new and you do enjoy listening to scary stories, uh, then consider subscribing for future uploads coming here. But uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with today's scary stories. So, this is a story that happened to my mom's friend in Korea about 10 years ago. Every time I hear this story, I still get the chills. My mom's friend lived in an apartment complex in Seoul. She was a stay-at-home mother with a young daughter, and her husband worked during the daytime. One day she was coming home from running her errands with her daughter and got onto the elevator in her building. When she got on, she noticed that there was a man wearing a cap and a yellow raincoat, and he kept his head low so that she couldn't really see his face. She immediately felt really uneasy, and she made her daughter stand to her side, furthest away from the man. What made her feel even more uncomfortable was that when she pressed a button for her floor, there was no other lit number, and on top of that, she noticed that he was carrying something wrapped inside newspaper close to his side. Things started to click in my mom's friend's head and she started to panic and then decided to take out her cell phone and pretend she was calling home to her husband, who was obviously really not at home and at work. She started saying things like, Oh, I'm on the elevator and about to get off. Can you get the door for me? And making it seem like her husband was waiting at home. When the elevator did reach her floor, I think she lived on the 12th floor or something, she quickly got off and grabbed her daughter and started to walk as fast as she could to her apartment. She noticed that the man also got off on her floor and was slowly following her down the hallway. When my mom's friend got to her door, she started to bang on it and shout, Hey dear, I'm home, please open the door and it kind of pretended like he was coming to answer the door. Upon seeing this, the man in the yellow raincoat started to walk away back towards the elevator. When he seemed to be far away enough, my mom's friend quickly picked up her daughter and slid open her door's passcode thingy. This is usually how people get into their homes in Korea, and started to frantically punch in her key code. But the problem was that the buttons would make sounds so the man knew that no one was going to answer the door for her, and he turned around and started to run back towards her. My mom's friend at this point, she was practically screaming, and when she finally did get her door open, the first thing she did was throw her daughter in through the door. When she got herself in, she saw that the man was pretty much inches from the door. But she managed to shut it and lock it before he could wedge his hand or weapon into the door. Afterwards, looking through the door's peephole, she saw that the man was walking away towards the elevator. Several months later, my mom's friend was watching the news, and there was a coverage story on the capture of a serial killer named Yu Young Chul who used to kill a lot of prostitutes. She told my mom that she could never forget the dread she felt when she saw the two familiar yellow raincoats and hat that he was wearing when they ended up apprehending him. This happened back in May. I was referred to the subreddit to share my tale, but correct me if I'm in the wrong area. But yeah, this Looney Tune, who here on out will be referred to as LT, found me on DeviantArt a year or so ago and requested some commissions of his OC characters. It's money. I take it. He likes it. He now thinks we're friends. Of course, I won't shoo him away. That's a mean thing to do. When he says hi on the front of my page, I say hi back. He'll then either ask for my Skype or Discord name. I do not reply because I don't give out that information to just anybody. I've had instances where people whom I've considered mere acquaintances, well, they buzz me nearly every hour with stuff about themselves and their ideas and their characters, without even asking beforehand if I was even interested in hearing about it. 
I had a funny feeling LT would be the same way, and since we barely talk on DeviantArt as it was, I would simply not reply to his request for Skype or Discord information. Come May of this year, he commissions me to draw his latest character. Again, money, so I accept it. He commissions me twice, the second time requesting slight redesigns. In between his commissions, he sends out a PM out of nowhere, describing in great detail what changes he wants me to make and why. Stuff I didn't ask beforehand, nor did I even care to know about. Afterwards, he sends me his character profile and asks what I think about it. Yeah, the character is a total Gary stew. Overpowered, no discernible flaws, and also a complete ripoff of an already existing protagonist of a popular anime series. Since LT has a habit of messaging me random details about his characters, and he ever so politely asked for my opinion, I decided to be honest with him and say all what I just wrote. Gary Stu doesn't fit in the universe he's based off, 100% ripoff of another existing character. Well, he deletes the profile and then PMs me again apologizing for making a Gary Stu. Like dude, you don't need to apologize, just work on improving yourself, that's all. He then proceeds to message me with nonsense about what he plans to change, what direction he wants to go with, who his Japanese seiyuu should be, and the amount of time he'll need to work on him before he'll submit his profile again. So I finally ask, why are you telling me this? I never asked you about this character of yours. I'm sorry, but I'm not interested. And told him is spamming someone with their ideas and characters was not going to interest them. It's going to annoy them. And let's face it, I was getting annoyed. When a friend of mine noticed the nonsense going on on my page, I'm going to randomly call her Bright Eyes. She decided to step in and explain to LT that he needs to tone down his behavior and just focus on his work and gather a crowd rather than force his stuff on people. He responded by deactivating his DA username. He promptly made a new DA account and wrote on his journal, going to work on this account until the real mink girl calms down. I find out about this because he tagged my username, which lets me see his journal. I don't know what he meant by that. Why am I in the wrong here? But whatever, I just block him because I don't want to deal with him anymore. He then deletes his new deviant art account and makes a third one. This time he goes to my friend Bright Eyes and PMs her, apologizing for his crazy behavior. It's just he has a mood disorder. He went on to explain how in the past he doxed a YouTube user and threatened to kill someone else because he was in a bad mood. He also goes on to say, I have blocked the real mink girl to ensure her safety which to me is a major cringe fest. Needless to say, I block this third account too, and shortly after, he deletes that one as well. A week later, I don't hear a word from him. I'm thinking he finally got a clue and moved on in his life. But no, it's not long when I receive an email from him saying, I think it would be best if I distance myself from you. I don't want to put you through all of that again. So please don't contact me after this. Well, okay. I don't know what's worse. The fact that he randomly emailed me after I stopped all contact with him initially so he could ask me not to contact him. Or the fact that he had emailed me and I've never given him my email address. So yeah, I don't reply, obviously. But the guy then manages to reactivate his original DeviantArt account and messages Bright Eyes on DeviantArt, apologizing once more, and how he needs to be reformed. Bright Eyes flat out tells him he's a stalker psycho, and he needs to just stop. He threatens to report her. She tells him he needs to drop all this and even stop emailing me, as that stalking behavior now. I did tell her about the email he sent, but his response? Looks like I'm going to have to kill her. Bright Eyes then chews him out for the apparent death threat against me. LT then sends me a second email, saying, I dare you. I double dare you, bitch. Just try to kill me. Okay? LT is officially mental. And if that wasn't bad, my mother called me. 
I moved away from home two years ago, and she was saying this strange sounding guy had called the house and left a voicemail saying, if this is, he uses my real name. He says, don't mess with me. No, 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 okay. Not only do I no longer live at that home, but I never, ever give out any of my phone numbers to anyone on the web. Unless, of course, I've known that person for years and trust them. LT was certainly not one of those people. But yeah, after that, I definitely called the police, because that is legit stalking, right? Anywho, that's my unfortunate run-in with a Looney Tune, and I'm glad I never met his ass in person. This happened during my senior year of high school back in 2007. I was living at my parents' house, who weren't extremely well off, so we didn't have central heat and air. This happened not long before my graduation, so April or May, which meant some nights it was hot outside, so we regularly opened the windows to put a box fan in the window. My room was a corner room, so I had two windows, one facing the front of the house towards the street, and one facing the side of the house. My bed ran parallel to the side window, with maybe a foot of space between that wall and my bed. The window came to about the middle of my bed. Directly under the window was my outlet. It hadn't been a very warm week, so my box fan wasn't in my window. One night, I was sitting in my bed working on some report for school. About 30 to 45 minutes into it, I see my laptop battery is low, so... I decide to plug it in. I grab the charger out of my bag, and I lean over to the outlet under the window. As I'm plugging it in, I glance up at the window, and I see a man staring down at me. I had a brief heart attack, and scrambled away from the window, never taking my eyes off of him. He's just standing there, leaning over, and looking straight at me. He looked angry, like I had viciously attacked him on a very personal level. This might be a good time to mention that I didn't even have a screen on my window. I can't speak. I can't move. I can't scream for help. I don't even know if anyone is home. We stay like that for what feels like forever, but may have only been a few seconds. Just frozen, staring at each other. I want to get off my bed and head for the door, but I'm afraid to turn my back to him. Finally, he starts shaking his head and says, Anyone could crawl through. I don't know why, but the way he said a crawl through just sent shivers down my spine. Maybe it was the fact that that was what he chose to say. I imagined him crawling through my window every night without me even knowing, and it just filled me with even more horror. I threw myself off the bed and ran for my door, and then I screamed for my brother and my dad while running down the hallway. They came out, and I frantically told them what happened and they ran outside to check around the house, but they didn't find anything. Anyway, I moved out not long after graduation, but I will never forget the way he said those words. Anyone could crawl through. The justice system in this country is so screwed up. People get away with atrocities all the time. Meanwhile, kids who have too much pot on them serve life in prison. But justice, it's never fair. People on the outside of a tragedy weigh the scales differently. They may plead for leniency, for fairness, forgiveness, while people on the inside, they just want to see the world burn. My sister has a lot to atone for. Growing up, I loved my older sister with a passion that is shared by only the closest siblings. Though for years my senior, we were two sides of the same coin. People thought we were twins. I was light, and she dark. I don't mean in the hokey sense that I was good and she was evil. Everyone has evil in them, even me, maybe even especially so now. No, I was all light. Light blonde hair, light blue eyes, light skin, and a light, bubbly, optimistic view of the world. And... Kara was dark. Dark hair, dark hazel eyes, and a dark view of the world. I don't say that looking back on what she's done, but just as who she is. Everyone was always out to get her. 
Girls hated her because she was pretty, not because she was petty. Teachers failed her not for her lack of intelligence, but out of spite. Kara always thought she deserved the best simply because she lived and breathed. However, ask me five years ago, and I wouldn't describe her that way. In truth, that's how she was. But I saw her in a different light simply because I loved her. Back then, I would have called her gorgeous, witty, strong-willed, outspoken, gracious, and maybe even kind. She was the mama bear and would hurt anyone who hurt me. Kara met James Dice when she was about 23. He was 20 and had everything she desired in a man. A nice car, rich parents, and could afford to spend on her the kind of money she thought she deserved. Their affair was short-lived, and eventually she married someone else, cheated, and had a love child. Her husband knew nothing of her affairs, and so raised Kylie as his own. For a year anyway. Eventually their marriage fell apart, and Akara moved back home with Kylie. She became unstable. She would yell, scream, curse at my mom and dare her to hit her. Meanwhile, she held a baby in her arms. She stole. I can remember the shame on my father's face when he called his mother to ask if she had put any cash in the Christmas cards, because the cards looked as if they had been opened and resealed empty. She wrote fraudulent checks, never once paid any of her bills. Car, phone, house, they were all still in her name. That March, Kara re-met James Dice, and after two weeks, married him. They moved back into the house she had shared with her former husband, even though it was getting foreclosed. Kylie started to change. She had always been a loving, bubbly, outgoing, happy child, and fiercely, fiercely intelligent. By a year and a half, she could speak in full sentences, not choppy baby talk, but could hold her own and understand an adult. Kylie started to withdraw though. She wasn't as talkative, and weird bruises started to show up. I will point out that James babysat her alone quite frequently. She had blood blisters on the back of her head, and even rug burn like she had been drugged. But the most sick part, the most horrifying one, she had blood blisters on her vagina area around her hole. Kylie started to hate bedtime. It wasn't normal, the kind of hate she had for it. She had never been a fearful child, but she grew to hate bedtime. I stayed at Kara's house once to see what went on. James put Kylie to bed. I found out every night, and I feigned astonishment because Kylie hated it so much and asked to see it in action. But James wouldn't let me into the room. One day, Kara and I were hanging out, and Kylie was with us. Kylie had been throwing up and getting sick a lot. She had grown very thin, not enough for CPS to step in, but enough to be noticed and concerning. Kara wouldn't take her to the doctor unless pressured by my mom. On that day, we went through the drive through at McDonald's, and Kylie vomited all over herself. Kara wouldn't touch her. My niece was sobbing and hysterical and covered in vomit, and she wouldn't lift a finger to help her. So I carried her into McDonald's and gave her a bath in the sink. I started to hate Kara that day. In May, just two months after marrying James, Kylie was admitted to the children's hospital, the burn unit specifically. Kylie suffered third degree burns on her left hand, left foot, and face. James was the only one home. Kylie was screaming. The pain medicine wasn't enough. Nothing was enough. She was in agony. I watched as Kara carried her back and forth, trying to calm her down. I hope that none of you have seen the atrocious realities of burns. But I will tell you that the worst ones leak. They leak a clear fluid. I watched my sister walk my niece as she dripped a clear fluid on the floor. I wish I could tell you that when I saw James, I beat him. I wish I could tell you that I ripped the flesh from his body the way he had my niece, but I didn't. I took James outside and asked if he had been high. I knew he had failed the drug test. I had gotten him a job the month before. He said that he had, but he never cried. He never cried for the pain Kylie had. 
So I pulled the nurses away and told them they needed to call the police, to call CPS because this was on purpose. Once Kylie was in the state of less pain, I was able to interact with her for the first time. She smiled so big that her smile cracked, and then she kissed me. Parts of her lips were left behind. She ended up staying at the hospital for a month, and what she endured there was every bit as horrific as the torture James put her through. To prepare for her skin grafts, they had to put her in a tub and scrub away the new skin. I'm sure most of you have burned yourself, and then put that burn in water. To me, burns are the worst kind of pain, especially that searing sensation when the injured flesh hits the water. She did that every day. I was never there when they did it to her, but I'm not sure I could have handled it. When they had to give her the skin graft, I begged for it to be me. I couldn't stand the thought of her hurting even more, but they couldn't. Kylie's other grandmother, Joni, never once cried for Kylie's pain. She was, from the beginning, on the offense. James would never do that on purpose. He would never hurt his daughter. It wasn't until my mother pointed out that he would probably spend time in jail that Joni ever cried, and that was when I lost my sister. The doctor's reports came out, and it seemed James' story didn't match up. He said that Kylie had overturned a pot of boiling water and gotten splashed. The doctor said she had immersion burns, and that her hand and feet had been dripped into it. It was usually seen with too hot bath water, but a much milder burn would have been the result. The facial burns, though, they matched with cases he had seen where a hot rag had been clamped on the victim's face. Kylie was released into the custody of my mother. She started to talk about what had happened. One day, Kylie looked at me and said, Daddy hurt me. Daddy is a bad man. I asked her why. She put up her finger like somebody was scolding her and repeated, Kylie is a bad girl. Kylie won't sit in the chair. Kylie hated high chairs. She threw a fit whenever she was in one. The police weren't going to file charges, but my mother pushed and pushed, and eventually they did. James was arrested and released on bail. Kara stopped seeing James to get her daughter back. Pretty soon they took her off supervised visitations. Kylie then began to withdraw again, but Kara swore James wasn't around. One day the CPS worker assigned to the case was in her neighborhood, and she saw James sneaking in the house. Kara only got supervised visits from then on, and then had another baby with James, and eventually one more, whom I've never met before. We stopped seeing Kara on December 3rd, 2012. We'd all been Christmas shopping, and I was changing Kara's newest edition, Sarah, on the floor of our conversion van. Kylie had been acting out lately and tried to stomp on Sarah. I blocked her with my hand, but unfortunately, the motion caused me to lightly smack Sarah, who then started to cry. Kara then whisked in, and I explained the situation. Kara started berating Kylie, who was three, telling her that she was a monster and that she would never see her baby sister again, that she couldn't even look at her without wanting to be sick, that she didn't love her. I snapped. I screamed that it was her fault, all of Kylie's difficulties. I was buckled in, between a window and a car seat, with another row of seating in front of me. Kara came after me with Sarah in her arms. I told her that I wasn't our mother, and that I would hit her even with a baby in her hands. But she came anyway. I punched her, and it was enough time for my mother and little sister to hold her back. Meanwhile, I got out of the seat. Kara set Sarah down in her stroller outside and attacked all of us. She didn't fare well, however. James was tried, and had a hung jury. They couldn't get a unanimous vote. I will never be able to thank those two people that held out, but I owe them much more than my own life. James was retired, and this time my younger sister, mother and I took the stand. Kara took the stand for the defense. James Dice was found a guilty. The prosecutor asked for 14 years. The judge looked at James and told him it was the most horrific crime he had seen. He gave him 16, and James finally cried. My mother, by chance, once met James's old elementary school teacher. 
She had been concerned for him and called his parents for a chat with a counselor. James displayed no emotions. James liked to hurt small animals. His mother wouldn't hear of it. Before I stopped talking to Kara though, she told me that James believed he had spoken with the devil, that James often fantasized about breaking into homes, tearing people's faces off, and then hanging it in front of themselves so they could wash their own face as they died. My parents got guardianship of Kylie, and Kara hasn't seen her in three years, technically by her choice, but I'm glad she made it, and it looks like she will never get her back. To me, that's not justice enough. James may have perpetrated the crime, but she stood by him. She would have endangered Kylie even more, if not for my family. She has two more children. James may be in jail, but there are a lot of sickos out there, and she won't protect them. Though through the years of therapy, Kylie grew closer to being healed, physically and mentally. But for a while after her abuse and being abandoned by her mother, I would find her rocking in some out-of-way place, sobbing to herself, meanwhile singing, Mommy doesn't love me anymore. Nevertheless, my sister has a lot to atone for. Edit. I try to change the names when they weren't properly switched. I was originally going to use the real name, so I missed a few when I try to switch them. For those that want the article and haven't found it, I did link it in the comments when I posted. Edit number two. I keep getting a lot of questions on why Kylie wasn't removed when we found blood blisters on her and several of the other signs of abuse. The fact of the matter is, yes, it is that hard to get a child removed when the signs of abuse can be explained by other means. On every single instance we could find, Kara had an excuse, even with all of her hospital visits, including the one with the rug burn on the back of her head, explained by her falling out of bed. All the medical doctors never once said, this is a clear sign of abuse. So, even though we had a medical record pages, along with her being in and out of hospitals, and all of her gut feelings, she was never even removed. And yes, we did call before she was seriously injured. Even after Kylie was initially removed, it took years for it to become permanent because DCS wants the child to stay with the birth parents. Their main goal is to not put the child into the care of another person. And even after she was burned, and we called again, she was not removed because we called, but because the doctors on her case made sure she was removed, because there was clear evidence that it was not an accidental injury. Even James wasn't going to be arrested until my mother made damn sure that those charges were being pressed. I can't believe I had forgotten about this, but here's another. I was 15 years old, and back in those days, you'd usually catch my friends and I at the big AMC movie theater. It's a huge theater. It kind of reminds me of an airport almost, and it was a popular hangout for kids that age on weekends. I remember going to the movies one night with friends, and a group of guys approached us. We started chatting and flirting, as you do at that age. They said they went to one of the local high schools. One of the guys I was talking to eventually asked for my phone number, and I gave it to him. I was naive, and I thought that this was harmless. These were the days before cell phones were ubiquitous, so I gave him my phone number. He called me maybe a day or two after that, and we talked for a bit. We had a few more phone conversations here and there before he asked me on a date. As we made plans to meet, he told me that he needed to tell me something. He admitted that he wasn't actually 16, or whatever age he said he was, and he wasn't in high school. He was 22. I fell silent trying to think of my response, but there was more. Not only was he 22, he had been in prison and was recently released. Why, you might ask? accessory to murder for being in the car when his friend has shot someone while driving by. I still remember the feeling of being frozen with fear. I calmly said that I didn't want to talk to him anymore and to please never call me again and hung up. After I hung up, the phone immediately started ringing. I picked it up, but before I could even say hello, 
This man had called back and was already screaming at the top of his lungs into the phone. I can't remember exactly what he was saying, but it was along the lines of, don't you ever effing hang up on me again, calling me every name in the book. So I hung up again, this time leaving the phone off of the receiver. I remember being so scared to tell my parents, primarily because I didn't want them to be disappointed in me. They were always so proud of me for making good decisions. After all, it was my fault giving some guy I just met my phone number, so I didn't say anything at first. The calls kept coming, but to keep my parents in the dark, I usually made sure I was the one answering the phone when it rang. He told me that he put my home phone number into a reverse phone directory, and he found my address. He would call and say things like, I like your sister's new green car, to make sure I knew he was watching the house. Around this time, I developed a fear of being home alone. I couldn't be alone even for a minute, so if my parents and sister were ever gone, I'd call a neighbor friend to spend time with me. One night, my parents were in bed, but my sister and I were up late watching television. We saw a car pull into our driveway, and it sat there with the lights on. I couldn't see who it was, but I knew. After that, everything stopped though. I remember thinking how crazy it was that he had done all that and then just disappeared. A year, maybe two years later, I was sitting at home watching the finale of American Idol. It's funny, the little random details you remember when something significant happens. And the phone rang. The caller ID said it was coming from a correctional facility. So confused, I answered it. It was a collect call from you know who. I couldn't believe it. I obviously didn't accept the call and I hung up. Never heard from him again. I told my parents about it years later and they said, no wonder you were so scared to be alone. I should have told them at the time because it could have escalated even further. The story mirrors a similar experience I had a year ago, one that I had posted here. I really do wonder if there is something about me that attracts these people. One lapse in judgment can lead to situations like these. Anyway, to all the creepy men I've encountered in my life, let's not meet again. Edit. I forgot to mention this part. It's still so upsetting to think about. On one of his harassing phone calls, he described how he saw a dog get hit by a car on the highway and the whole time he was laughing. Not in a way that was just intended to scare me though. Although that was the point. He was laughing like he genuinely found it funny. This person was an absolute psychopath. On October of 2016, a long time family friend began harassing my family. So I've known this guy since I was around five. He worked at my dad's friend's car dealership as the person who basically maintenances the exteriors, who washes the cars, shines them, etc. My parents became fond of him because he looked very sweet, and they rather felt pity for him as he had horrible hygiene habits. They'd often buy him food, gift him clothing, and things of that sort. Around 2015, this man gets a job right across the street from my mom's job. He saw my mom one morning and they just waved at each other. This man starts calling my mom frequently. Now, my mom is extremely nice. Too nice. So instead of just not picking up, she would not talk to him. This guy becomes obsessed with my mom to the point that she tells him to stop contacting her around May of 2016. All is well. The guy stops contacting mom. Months later, he began to watch my mom. He would park his car in front of my mom's job and then watch her. She noticed him, but she never saw it as a huge threat, so she never said anything. That's where things escalate. My mom was walking out of work with a co-worker one day, a normal co-worker friendship. My mom catches a ride with her co-worker to a mandatory work event. That way she wouldn't have to drive home too late, as these events end late at night. Meanwhile, the guy is watching them walk to his car. 
He suddenly thinks that my mom is having an affair with this guy and then decides to follow them. They arrive at the place and my mom stays in the car while her co-worker goes inside to check if it's the right location. The stalker then walks up to the car, opens the door, and slaps my mom, then grabs a knife from his car and slashes the co-worker's tires. My mom is in complete shock and then immediately calls her co-worker to come outside. The co-worker decides to not press any charges against him, even though he easily could, as there were cameras outside the location. Now, my mom mentions none of this to my dad because my dad is really explosive. It's to the point that he will get in trouble over this guy. So, everything is okay for a couple of days. Until this guy starts calling my mom nonstop and leaving her threatening voicemails. The voicemail said things along the lines of, If you don't meet up at the hotel on Wednesday at 1pm, I'm going to tell your husband you're cheating on him. This scares my mom because my dad has a past with domestic violence, so she's scared my dad will believe him and then beat her. Wednesday comes along when she gets to work and he's outside watching her the whole day. She calls my grandparents. They're not old farts, by the way, as my grandpa is an ex-military, ex-judoka, and is nobody to play with. They immediately drive to my mom's job, but this guy starts harassing my grandparents as well, and won't leave my mom's job. 1pm comes around, and my mom calls the police. Dude hauls across the street and hides leaving his car at my mom's job. The police search for him everywhere, and he's nowhere to be found. The phone calls, however, continue, and things escalate. This man then decides to vandalize my mom's car. He throws tar all over my mom's car while the car is parked outside the house. The car is destroyed, and my parents have to pay lots of money to be able to fix it. At this point, my dad knows of the whole ordeal, and he's set on killing this guy. We advise him to calm down because my mom is planning on getting a restraining order from him and she didn't want my dad to ruin her chances or commit a crime. He continues calling and stands outside my mom's job every day. This man then starts driving by my house every day and begins to see me as a target. He leaves my mom a threatening voicemail saying he's going to vandalize my car. So at this point, I'm even more terrified. Now at this point in the story, my mom has had to call the cops on him several times. But the cops say they can't do anything as he hasn't physically attacked her. My mom decides she's going to finally petition for the restraining order with the police reports and voicemails as proof. They set up a court date and they give my mom a temporary restraining order until the court date. So approximately two weeks. This guy does not stop calling my mom, so my mom calls the detective in charge of her case, and the guy hasn't even been served with a restraining order yet, a few days before the court date. He was notified with the court date though, so he tells my mom he has proof that she won't stop calling him. He then starts targeting the rest of us. I wake up one Saturday morning, and my car has letters drawn all over the windows with nail polish. Luckily, we were able to just scrape it off gently, but by now I'm a nervous wreck. I start doing bad in my classes, and I hadn't slept for about a month. He then begins to harass my dad with voicemails and phone calls, but luckily my dad didn't buy any of his BS. Finally, the court date arrives. This man shows up with his stepson, and his stepson starts talking shit to my mom. That was because, of course, he only knows this man's side of the story. The judge calls them in and does the usual questioning. He talks about police reports, etc. The judge then asks him if he has anything to say or show. He says, Yeah, I have a phone bill that shows she called me more than 200 times in the past month. The judge says, Okay, show me. Well, guess what? He didn't bring it. There is no such thing. So the judge nods her head and says, Okay, I reached the verdict. He was found guilty, and my mom was awarded a restraining order for life. We finally have peace in mind in our family again. So, family stalker, screw you. Let's not meet again. Edit.
Just want to tell people who might be in similar situations, please go to the police as soon as possible. The danger and the emotional torture is just not worth it. Sometimes they won't go away like we thought this guy would. We just took too long to take action. This happened a few years ago. Context. I live in England and I was 23 years old at the time. I'd come out of a serious long-term relationship at 22. We were engaged and I was absolutely broken. I didn't even think about dating or any type of love interest for a year at least. I had worked hard to put myself back together and had even seen a counselor and was taking anti-anxiety medication. I decided it was time to try and find a love again, but it was a big mistake. I met a man on Tinder. He was 27 and seemed really friendly, and we hit it off really quickly. We went on a fair few dates and we saw each other for a few months. As the relationship progressed, he started to get more and more possessive. He didn't like the fact I had my own job, my own friends, my own house, or a close relationship with my family. I knew I had to cut things off quickly because it was becoming too much to handle and I could not survive another horrific relationship experience. I was already too fragile. I told them that I still wasn't ready to get serious with someone and actually needed to spend more time alone to look after myself. He took it well. Nice. Relief. Until of course he reached his own home and the text messages and the phone calls began. He called me all sorts of horrendous names, and then would come back with saying how he's not worthy, how I'm amazing and he's just devastated that he's lost me. I firmly told him that I had meant what I had said and that things were not going to happen. He accepted this, at least for a while. I started getting ads on various social media that were fake accounts he had made. He called me on various numbers, withheld numbers, public phone numbers, etc. He turned up on my driveway without warning one day. He even turned up at my place of work and he harassed a colleague of mine. I threatened him with police action if he did not stop, and I moved back in with my parents as I did not feel safe at home. For months he tried to contact me in various ways, and it became exhausting trying to block him from my life. Then one day he changed his tactics. My grandfather had recently passed away, and we were very close, so I visited his grave weekly to put flowers on it, and to sit and think. I arrive one morning, and there is a letter on the grave. Only myself and my family ever go there, so I was very confused by it. It was from Jay, and he was begging me to take him back, telling me he would do anything and everything to make me his again. It got threatening towards the end and I decided that enough was enough. This had gone too far. So I contacted the police and I had a restraining order put in place. I am still not confident enough to date again. I guess you could say I'm sort of scared. Anyway, graveside caller, please let's never meet again and stay away from my family. I went to a wedding of my friend Courtney about two days ago and I still can't shake my mind over what happened. For context, I grew up in a very religious household, and I went to a church every Sunday, and Courtney is probably the only person from my old church that I still keep in contact with. The situation started at the reception. Courtney was super excited to see me, and she was definitely the only person who felt that way, judging from all the stares from the people at my old church. I sat down at my table and started playing something on my phone, and that's when some guy sat next to me. He said that the seating chart said he was supposed to sit at my table, and then introduced himself as the groom's friend Anthony. He was pretty cute, so I spent a lot of time talking to him, and we really hit it off. He didn't seem to judge me for being an atheist, and seemed genuinely interested in me. When the dance started, they started playing Brown Eyed Girl, and he offered to dance with me. We danced together for most of the night, until he left to go to the bathroom, and a little later I did too. When I came out, I saw that my purse wasn't on the table, 
which was weird because I swore I left it on there. I was tired and I thought I just left it in my car, so I went in the parking lot and into my car to look for it and I found it on the center console. I still thought it was weird because I really thought I brought it inside, but at that point it was pretty late in the night, so I didn't think much of it. I danced some more, and I noticed that Anthony was gone. I asked the groom who said he had gone home because he wasn't feeling too well. Pretty soon, I felt pretty sick too, so I said bye to Courtney, and I went to my car. As I put my keys in the ignition, I looked behind me and I saw something weird. It looked like something had ducked down from the trunk. I took my keys out and I looked back there and that was when I saw him. Anthony was crouched down in the trunk of my car. So naturally I started screaming and then I ran out with him chasing after me. I went inside and I told Courtney who then immediately told her husband who walked me back to my car where Anthony was nowhere to be seen. Courtney's husband said that he didn't see his car anywhere, so he most likely left. I left, and I still feel sick to my stomach thinking about it. He could have easily gone home with me and killed me if I hadn't looked back there. Courtney said that she feels terrible that she invited him, and that she had no idea that he would do that. I haven't stepped out of my house since, because I'm worried that if I do... He's going to be waiting for me like he was before. Update. The last couple of days have been kind of crazy, so I haven't had the chance to look, but thank you for all of your advice. I wish I'd have known about it earlier. Unfortunately, my address was on my identification card, and as I learn now, Anthony took photos of it. Anthony and the groom aren't exactly friends, but they know each other well enough for him to be invited. After the whole fiasco, the groom tried to text Anthony about it, but he got no response. Anthony showed up at my job and was lurking around the parking lot before he ran off when he saw security. He left me a note on my windshield that just says, I'm watching. Security at my job has been notified about him, so hopefully I'm going to be safe there. I was told by other people that went to the wedding that he was introducing himself as my boyfriend and that he was planning on proposing. I'm currently trying to file a restraining order against him and I feel horrified. He lives in my city and knows where I live, so I'm staying at my aunt's house as I speak. If anything else happens, I will update again. To start, I go to school in Boston. But for privacy reasons, I'm not going to include the name of the school, but if anyone reading this also goes here, I think you'll be able to figure it out. So at the end of the spring semester last year, one of the dorm buildings on campus was closed for renovations. Since then, construction crews have been constantly working on completely stripping the building and then redoing it entirely. Lately, it's become a bit of an issue because the dorm I'm living in now is right next to it, so residents are often woken up very early in the morning to the work being done. In response, the school set up a meeting for students to voice their concerns to the project manager and also members of the administration here. Obviously, nothing can be done to stop the construction. They just want to make it look like they care and are trying to do something about it but I'll get back to this later. Anyway, on a few occasions, I've seen workers doing work right outside my window. There's probably like a 20 foot gap between my room and a part of the building having all the construction being done, so I have a really clear view of anyone out there. If my windows are open, I can also hear them talking. I never really thought much of it. I expected to see people there. The weird thing is that sometimes the workers would show up really late like between the hours of 12.30 a.m. and 2 a.m., so late. I usually notice because I'll see flashlights moving outside my window, and then I'll hear the door that leads onto the roof opening and shutting. At first, I was a little weirded out by it. Why would they need to be up there that late? As it continued, though, I just started ignoring it because I figured it was just some late-night crew or security that went up to make sure that nothing was out of place. 
As I very recently found out though, that is not the case. About a week ago, I was lying in bed trying to fall asleep. Suddenly, there's a brief flash that lights up the room. I looked around for a minute, and then it happened again. I looked out the window, and I realized it was just the workers walking around the roof with flashlights. I ignored them, and I tried to fall back asleep. But before I could even close my eyes, though, I heard a conversation ensue. He's sleeping, a deep voice said. Yeah, looks like it, responded another voice. Tonight? asked the first voice. Eh, no, let's wait a little longer, said the second voice. Whatever you say, said the first. Soon after, I heard the door shut and peeked out the window to see both of them had left. I stayed frozen in my bed for a while, and I was wondering if they had been talking about me. I eventually told myself they were talking about a friend of theirs or something, and I had nothing to worry about. So I closed my eyes and I fell asleep. When I woke up, I was still a little worried, so I asked my roommates if they'd ever seen or heard those guys out there. Both of them thought I was joking, but I assured them I was very serious. Both said they had no idea what I was talking about. They didn't come back for another week. But before I saw them again, I decided to attend the sit-down the school had set up. When it was my turn to speak, I asked about the late night crew. I wanted to know why they were up there so late, and if it was entirely necessary as it was preventing me from getting a full night's rest. The project manager just stared at me for a minute. Late night crew? He asked. Yeah, the guys who come there sometimes really late. They just kind of walk around with flashlights, I responded. He stared at me for another minute or so. We don't have a late night crew, he said in a quiet voice. No one said anything. Everybody was just staring at me. Finally, though, someone from the administration said that it was maybe homeless people who had found their way up to the roof, and they were using it as a shelter, and that they would keep a better eye on the entrances to the building at night. There are a lot of impoverished individuals in the area, so it sort of did make sense. The only part I was still confused about was that the people aren't staying up there all night, but just for about 5 to 10 minutes. I decided not to mention that part. That was two days ago. I didn't see anyone that night, but last night is a different story. Same as usual. I was lying in bed trying to fall asleep, and that's when I heard the door open again. This time though, there were no flashlights. Very slowly, I strained my neck to get a look out the window while still remaining hidden. I saw two figures standing on the roof facing my window. Nothing happened for about 30 seconds, and then one of them said something. I recognized the two voices as the ones from before. Their conversation went a little like this. Did you get that email from Bill? Bill is the project manager, by the way. Yeah, looks like this isn't going to work out, huh? Guess not. You think he's listening right now? It's possible. Are you? Can you hear us, buddy? Are you listening? At this point, my heart was practically beating through my chest. I didn't know how to react. I just stayed in the same position, I completely frozen, and I was hoping they would just leave. Cut it out. We really shouldn't be up here much longer. What? I'm just messing around. But yeah, you're right. Looks like this is goodbye, bud. But don't worry, though. We'll be seeing you around. After a brief moment of neither of them speaking, they both turned to the door and walked away. I didn't sleep much last night because of that. I don't really know how to handle something like this, and if I should bring it up with the school again. Based on what they said though, it seems like they won't be around anymore. Still though, these guys know where I live. I can only hope they haven't seen my face, but I think I'll be avoiding the construction area for a while. I have a resentful stalker who is slowly, yet rapidly, if that makes sense to anyone, becoming textbook. I've posted about him before, but I can't really remember if I've deleted it or not. I want this documented so it's fresh in my mind, and I'll know exactly what to say when police intervention starts to show up. I've known this stalker, Steve, since high school. 
For him, it was love at first sight. He pursued me several times, but failed. He mostly accepted it, but never quite let it go at the same time. But there was a point where we fell out back in our teens, and he started bombarding me with abusive text messages. Very distressing. My mom has despised him ever since, because she sees it as a forced friendship, and she's 100% right. Looking back, I wasn't friends with him because I liked him. It was just easier. He's also mentally challenged, but I don't believe anyone's really done anything about it. Probably wouldn't be posting on here if that were the case. We also work for the same company. I'm already apprehensive about letting that information slip, but screw it. I need it for context. I guess that's enough relevant backstory though. I'll add to it if I remember anything. I'll try and keep this as short as I can. Present. Some lass called Maria allegedly borrowed thousands of pounds from Steve and never paid it back. Steve went on a rampage and tried getting as many people involved as he could, which included me. It didn't work though. And did it in a staff member from a different store to report him to the police for harassment. He has been banned. He went mad about that too, but still had a vendetta against Maria, so mostly focused on that. During this period, he would come into work for a few days a week, and he would bitch about the aforementioned staff member. Eventually, he was coming in every damn day, to the point where my cashier would warn me over the headset whenever he popped in, so I'd run into the office or the garage until he was gone. Of course, if he ever caught me just as he was leaving, best believe he'd run back and talk to me. He also made two radio announcements. The first wishing me a happy birthday, and the second one praising my hard work. He also left me a Google review, which is still there, and on my phone. My manager eventually told him to do one nicely, so he stopped coming in. He wasn't too happy about it, but he understood and left. He hasn't been back since. Then he picked on a mutual friend, who I believe works in finance, and pretty much told him that his plans were simply not feasible. He went on a hate campaign against our friend, so I blocked him, including his number. Of all the people to have a go at. Then he created a fake account of a mutual friend Rowan, and said something like, Hey, so I hear you and Steve aren't talking anymore. What's going on? So I responded with, I don't remember you spelling your name with an H. He deleted the account, and then he created one of Maria followed by a friend from high school, John, followed by one of his old colleagues. He also texted me on a different number, same network that he's always used. I checked, pretending to be another mutual friend, Naz, and started putting himself down. I don't think I have screenshots of this, but I may still have the text messages saved on my old phone. It was saying it would be great if he killed himself and shit. I called him out on it, and eventually, he stopped. I know, engage equals enrage. I am stupid, but in my defense, I didn't quite clock it was him straight away until he let it slide and projected his usual mannerisms and self-pity. Earlier, I mentioned that he made a fake account of one of his old colleagues. I didn't respond. I was learning by this point and did the usual work of taking screenshots, reported the account, blocked the account, sent evidence to the real people. I sent these screenshots, still have them, to his older brother who then promptly put him in his place. It didn't take too much convincing as this dude is not really a good actor, so it's super easy to identify his verbiage and style of writing, as well as the self-pity slash self-persecution shit. He stopped for a while, but I had WhatsApp messages from him cutting himself, blocked. Our friend had committed suicide, and it crushed him. It crushed everyone, and now he wants to put everyone through that again. He knows exactly what he's doing. It started up again, though, when he messaged me, asking if I was the one who called the police on him for hitting his mom. I denied it, because, what? I don't talk to you, dude. Ever. I can't remember what led me to it, but turns out he was messaging me quite a bit on Instagram. I don't go on it much, so when I went on my messages, it was just bombarded with word salad. Asked me if I was the person who kept sending pizza to his work. I'm going to hell for this, but that was funny. 
which I obviously denied because why the hell would I do that? He started really spiraling out of control at this point. He did in fact assault his mom, screenshots, admitted to it, and even sent a message to my manager prior to this saying, she's my mom, I can do whatever I want to her. He reported it to the police, who did a welfare check on him. Guess what? I got a message. Did you call the police on me? No, I didn't, Steve. I can barely keep track as it is, but the TLDR for the rest of the story is this. He eventually hit his mom for telling a half-truth about his sickly cat getting better. It died from natural causes from what I'm aware of. Then, I had full purged my accounts a few times as well at this point, so it was harder and harder for him to contact me. He created another account, actually himself this time, but he found my alt and tried talking to me. Blocked. Created a group chat with me and mutual friends in it. Blocked. Messaged me again. Blocked. Screenshots because he was showing signs of extremely obvious self-persecution and I started getting progressively anxious and concerned about his mental state. Texted me on a different number, same network, pretending to be a colleague, asking me to come in and prove I don't want him dead. I sent it to his manager, blocked, created a fake account to me which my friend informed me of. Account gone once friend confronted it. On the first he wrote a survey for my store and he was accusing me of coming into his branch threatening and hitting him, saying he should fall off a cliff, burn himself. Pretty nasty stuff. My manager and his manager went livid. He's on disciplinary action. I'm not going to the police yet because I was stupid enough to let them deal with it in-house, so I'm left in the dark over this. He texted my boyfriend earlier, accusing me and multiple others of plotting to kill him and we should go for it. What the hell do I do about this guy? Edit. I've taken your advice to heart. I'm currently collecting extra screenshots and currently organizing them into a folder to make it easier for myself when I go to the police station tomorrow. Feels better to do this in person as opposed to emailing, which I was about to do. Speaking of screenshots, I royally misremembered a piece of information regarding Steve's hate campaign against Rowan. I also never mentioned this before, but... After I blocked Steve, I took a screenshot of a not very nice status he put up about Rowan, so I started messaging him. It was then I asked what led to this. Turns out he randomly messaged Rowan claiming that he owed him money. He asked for proof of this, which never happened. He then started to message poor Rowan about some stupid shit, like starting a petition to get his money back from Maria. He told Steve that it was not appropriate or even correctly constructed. He refused to sign the petition. He did not take this well. He cooled off and apologized afterwards, but then he doubled down. In his words, he would melt down subsequently. There's message after message of stocky Steve calling him a certain four-letter C word in all caps. The one spelled... C-U-N-T. The poor guy. I've saved a couple of messages from Rowan which displayed clear distress and anxiety. Would that be appropriate? I should probably ask him first, actually. I was 14 years old when I had to live with my grandparents. I had to live with them because my sister was in college and my parents were divorced. They lived in this old bungalow type of house. It was one story, and we have stairs that immediately goes up to the attic. In attic, which no one really uses by the way, we just put stuff in there. It's too hot and stuffy up there. The sole window up there didn't really help much at all. The attic had old creaky wooden floors that I remember I had to polish with coconut shell, cause that's just how we do it here in the Philippines. That, and also my grandparents are very traditional. Anyway, my door room was near the stairs leading up to the attic. Like, you open my door and then face right, and the stairs would be immediately be right there. I hated that every time I left my room. It was mainly because I would expect that something would be immediately crawling down from the attic. 
One night, my grandparents had to pick up my aunt's family from the airport, but because of the hellish traffic here, they had to leave at 7pm and their expected arrival back home would be at almost 5am. So a 14 year old girl would be alone at home the whole time. I told them I'd be safe here though. We live in a gated community, we got tons of guard dogs too, and everything is going to be okay. Or at least, so I thought. Now before they left, we already had dinner so I was stuck with cleaning the dishes and all. As I was doing that, I could hear a bunch of neighboring dogs bark a lot. I didn't really think of it much, mainly because the dogs always do that. When I finished cleaning up from dinner, I immediately had to lock every door and window and close all the lights before heading to bed. When I entered my room, the lights were open and it looked normal. My anime posters were on the wall. My closet was untouched. My bed was next to my barred tinted windows. We had to tint them because I was on the first floor and my grandparents wanted to make sure that nobody would peep into a young girl's room. They were barred too because my uncle, who used to use the room, always escaped through there to go to parties. This was my grandparents' solution to that. Nothing was out of place to alarm me. Everything was normal. Until I closed the lights. As soon as I closed my lights, a silhouette of a man was illuminated by the streetlights outside. He looked like he had thick curly hair and a skinny build. I thought I was having hallucinations to be honest. So I opened the lights again and he was gone. I decided to close it again. He was back again. Opened. Gone. Closed. Gone. Well, I sighed in relief. I was just tricking myself I guess. Or something else was casting the shadow. So I double locked my door just to be safe. One with a doorknob lock and one of those door latch type locks. Then I tucked myself in. It was hard to fall asleep when a lot of dogs were barking outside. They weren't our dogs after all, it was the neighbors. But I was finally falling asleep. But then I heard something from above me moving, something in the attic. I pushed down the thought, I'm tricking myself again I say. So I hugged my pillow. It just has to be rats, I said to myself. These rats seemed heavy and were also pushing furniture around. My heart sank when I heard them hurriedly go down the stairs and then stop at the bottom. I covered myself with my blanket and I waited for something to happen. I was also wishing that my parents had given me a phone at the time like this, but I only waited in bated breath. Suddenly, I heard my doorknob being gently fiddled. I wanted to vomit when I heard a click followed by a quiet turn of the knob. The knob turned, but it didn't budge. When they noticed, they tried to push it. This time, I finally stood up. I was shaking. I was a kid after all. I'm home alone with no phone, no means of defense. All that was saving me was this thick door from the old days. So I softly pushed my body up against the door and I locked everything up again. I didn't want to make a sound though. I didn't want to scream. I didn't want him to know I was here. I don't know why he stopped, but he did. And I didn't go back to my bed. I just sat there at the door, waiting, as it felt like forever. I then heard footsteps go up the stairs, but I still sat there. Then I saw something move in the corner of my eye. There, out the window, the shadow was back. I forced myself not to look. All I could think of was thank god they were barred. I don't remember what happened after that. I think I fell asleep or I was too scared to even think straight. I just remember the next day when my family and I were finally having breakfast. I casually brought it up to them. Hey, grandfather? I think I heard footsteps in the attic last night. My grandmother scoffled and said, It's probably rats. I never brought it up again after that. I didn't want to worry them. I probably was, but I do know this. Our dogs were caged up near the gate and were far from my room, so they wouldn't have seen anything. The only dogs who were near my room were the neighbors. Also, there was nothing outside my window that could cast a shadow that looked like a man. Lastly, the attic window was open. 
This happened to me this morning, and it reminded me of a story that I saw on Let's Not Meet about the smiling man, so here it is. I have had a lot of trouble sleeping recently, so a lot of the time if it gets to 8 or 9 in the morning, I'll stop trying and go get some stuff done early. Last night was one of those nights, so I decided to take my dogs for a short early walk in the park beside my house. I've never been afraid of walking at night. I'm tallish and live in a quiet suburb, so the fact that it was dark didn't worry me. I head out with my dogs and into the park, which is partially lit by lamps but still quite dark. When I was a kid, there was this one stretch of unlit pathway that used to scare me in the dark, so when I'm walking there, I'm more aware of my surroundings because of that. As we started walking along that bit of path, one of my dogs, Alif, turns around and starts barking. I turn around and I notice a man jogging behind me. As he gets to about 10 feet behind me, he just stops immediately and starts walking towards me. I've got mild alarm bells already, but I keep calm and nod to him as he walks past me. I couldn't make out his features much, but I did notice that he was staring directly at me, keeping eye contact even as he passed me out. I said a short, how are ya, as he passes, but he just stays completely silent. As soon as he's about 10 feet past me, he starts jogging again, down towards a part of the path lined by trees. I'm properly spooked now, so I take out my phone and send a voice message to my friend group on WhatsApp. I explain to them what had just happened. I'm just done explaining this, and that's when I hear a noise, and I turn around. The guy is jogging up behind me again. Now to give some context, there's only the one path, and he was in front of me. In order to get behind me without me missing him, he would have had to run to the area under the trees, turn around, crept past me across the grass quietly, and then come back up the path behind me. I turn around and watch him come up to me, stop jogging, walk past, and I say the same short sentence again, and then he jogs off. I decide I'm getting the hell back to my house, but the little laneway that leads to my road is up ahead, which means I have to keep walking the same way. I get about 50 meters up that stretch of path, in between the lampposts, when Alfie starts making grumbling pre-bark noises again. I look up, and there he is ahead of me, just standing beneath one of the orange lights, looking in my direction. My heart is thumping, but I know I'm definitely going to keep facing that direction. No way I'm turning around. I had seen another guy just riding his bike around the park, and there are houses that connect to it, so I'm not completely isolated, and I've got a big dog. The laneway to my road is just past him, so I let my dogs pull me up the path. And as soon as we got to him, Alfie tried to move towards him. This causes him to have to move and shift position. I pull Alfie away and start talking to the dog, saying, Okay guys, let's go home. Come on, this way, etc. And I don't stop talking until we get out of the park, feeling my back completely exposed the whole time. My house is just across from the laneway, so I make my way really quickly towards the gate. Just as I'm about to put in the code though, a loud sound like a bin falling over comes from behind me, from the other row of houses, the ones that back onto the park. I spun around to look at my neighbors, just in case one of them had opened their door to go to work. But nobody, not a sound. Screw that. I put the code into the gate quickly and make it inside as fast as possible. I then went to my room and fell straight to sleep. And I'm never walking in that park alone at night again. That guy was the biggest creep. And I hope I never run into him again. Some crazy people can show it in their eyes. This happened last September. I was 25. I'm female. I had just gotten out of my class on early childhood education at my college in Southern California. It was that golden hour before sunset, maybe 6 or 7 p.m. I just said goodbye to my friends, and I started walking home. I walked every day to and from school because I only lived about a mile away. A guy approached me and said hi. He was about 6 feet tall and kind of overweight. 
He had a shortish brown hair, and he wore glasses. He was wearing a black and red shirt and black pants. I took out my earphones, and I smiled. He said, I don't want you to think I'm some creep, but I just wanted to say you're the prettiest girl I've ever seen. I said thank you. I don't mind getting compliments, and at first I didn't feel anything off about him, but I was hoping this was the end of the interaction. But he kept asking me questions, such as how my day was going. I'm a pretty open person, so I was truthful and said I had a bad day because I ran into my ex. He asked why that ruined my day, and I answered, I don't know, probably because I love him. This made him a bit agitated, and I said I had to go home. The guy started walking with me, and he said he had parked in the parking lot. It's in the same direction I'm walking in. He then asks me questions like, do I have a lot of friends? Am I outgoing? I answered yes, and that I love talking to new people and being around them. I didn't think this question was too odd, until what he said next. Really? I hate people. They're disgusting. Just a rotting, meaty body bag. This is when my insides started screaming at me, saying, Holy shit, this guy is insane. So I awkwardly chuckled and I began walking faster. He then asked me, Is anyone expecting you to come home? I remember looking at him and his face was just pure evil. I said yes, that my friend Roy was living with me temporarily. The stranger looked at me with disgust and said, Are you sleeping with him? I was absolutely appalled, and I told him no, although it wasn't any of his business. He apologized for being crass, but he just needed to know. Finally, we make it to the street lights where he would turn into the parking lot, and I would continue straight home. But instead, he stopped walking. He said he could give me a ride home, and also asked for my number. I said no, that I prefer to walk anyway. He then got this huge smile on his face, and he said that he actually lied and he had parked in the lot all the way across campus. He told me he had seen me walking this way for a few days now. I told him very sternly I was not interested, and if I saw him again, I'd beat the shit out of him. He just put up two hands, as if saying, my bad, and turned around and walked away. I haven't seen him again, but even retelling this, I could perfectly visualize him. Dear weirdo who tried to give me a ride, let's not meet ever again. So that was the last story for today's episode. If this was the first time you joined us, then do consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell. That way you'll be notified of all the future uploads coming here to the channel. Also, make sure to leave a like rating if you enjoyed it, and leave a comment telling me what you all thought. Also, if you yourself have a scary story that you'd like to share, then send it in with my user submissions email, which appears on screen on my videos, tcfnarrations at gmail.com. Now, if you're looking for more of the Creepy Fox, then check out all the other videos I got on my channel. There's so much narration content that I'm sure you're going to enjoy. I've also got some exclusive Scary Stories narration episodes. If you'd like to listen to those, then for as little as $2 a month, you can become a Creepy Fox channel member and gain access to 10 plus hours of extra additional content. I also got some cool merch which is featured down below. There's shirts, stickers, sweaters, coffee mugs, you name it. I got a lot of things that you might like, so check it out, see if you might find something on the Creepy Fox shop. Lastly, it's not something I really talk about or mention, but I wanted to go ahead and plug my other social media. If you wanted to follow me on my Instagram, I'm pretty active there. It's at the Creepy Fox official. You can see the name on the bottom right of all my videos. I like to post videos of my pets, specifically my dog and my birds, so if you're somebody that likes animals, then give me a follow and check out my stories. I'm always posting daily. Anyway, that is going to go ahead and do it for today. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching today, and I'll go ahead and catch you all on the next episode. Until then, T.
Take care and have yourself an amazing day.